So good morning. So we are in the week of November 9th through the 12th. We finished up chapter 15. So we're actually going to start chapter 17 in hopes that we can get through as much of chapter 17 and 16 next week. Uh, so we don't have much left to do after Thanksgiving. Okay. All right. And again, you've got your exam four. It's due this week. So I believe it's through Friday for chapters 12, 13, and 14. Neuro tissue, spinal cord, and spinal nerves, brain, and cranial nerves. Okay. So, and then I posted the updated uh, exam review. There's a little bit more that I wanted you to make sure you had. Um, so I posted that. So hopefully you all got a chance to look at that. All right. All right. So let's start with chapter 17. All right. All right, so we got our five special senses, olfaction, which is your sense of smell, gustation is your sense of taste, vision, right? You know what that is, equilibrium and he hearing. So those have to do with the ear. All right, olfaction. Is again your sense of smell. You have olfactory organs that give you that sense of smell. And they're, they're located in your nasal cavity. The lamina propria and the olfactory epithelium are your two layers of your olfactory, olfactory organs. The olfactory receptors, supporting cells, and stem cells are in the olfactory epithelium. The olfactory glands or Bowman's glands are in the lamina propria. So when you breathe in, you inhale, the compounds that are in the air get brought towards your olfactory organs. And when you sniff, you bring in air more rapidly. So materials that are soluble in water or in lipids can diffuse into the mucus in your nasal cavity and then stimulates your olfactory receptors. All right, so the olfactory receptors themselves are actually just modified neurons, okay? But they're sensitive to chemicals that get dissolved in that mucus. So 10 to 20 million olfactory receptors get packed into an area uh, as small as five square centimeters. All right, so where does the olfactory reception actually occur? And that's on the surfaces of the olfactory cilia. Okay, remember cilia kind of help with movement and moving things, you know, through your nasal cavity. So when dissolved chemicals interact with odorant binding proteins, that just means proteins that can bind to a receptor and they smell. Or they have an odor. So an odorant is a chemical that stimulates the olfactory receptors. Okay. So our sense of smell has to do with interactions between odorants and receptors. Okay. okay, so the olfactory pathways involve a highly sensitive olfactory system. And they're extensive hypothalamic connections and limbic connections. So kind of reaching back to our discussion of the hypothalamus and the limbic system. Olfactory stimulation is your only type of sensory information that's gonna reach your cerebral cortex uh, without first getting or having a synapse in the thalamus, okay? So it's gonna go straight to the cerebral cortex. Okay, so in the case of olfaction, your olfactory system can distinguish or discriminate between two to 4,000 chemical stimuli. Okay, so in this, in this context, when we say discrimination, we're talking about distinguishing, telling the difference uh, between different smells or odors. And your central nervous system can interpret these different smells by the patterns of the activity of the different olfactory receptors. Okay, so 
what the re receptors do in reaction to the stimulus, the odorant gives you an idea of what the actual smell is. Okay, so as you get older, your number of olfactory receptors actually decreases. So your sense of smell can decrease or get worse as you get older, okay? And there's turnover in those olfactory receptors. So sometimes they're being created and destroyed. All right. So that's olfaction. So let's take a minute, talk to your partner about what you've learned about olfaction. Okay. You can do this at home as well. All right. So taste is gustation. All right. You've got gustatory receptors clustered in your taste buds in your tongue. Adults going to have around 3,000 taste buds. T taste buds are going to be related to or associated with epithelial projections on your tongue's dorsal surface. Okay. You know, we call those lingual papillae. All right, remember dorsal is toward the back. You have three different kinds of lingual papillae. You have the filiform papillae, fungiform papillae, and the circumvallate papillae. And you'll learn more about these in lab. The lingual papillae give you friction against objects in your mouth. Okay, it kind of helps you break them down. Gustatory receptors. So inside the taste buds, you have around 40 gustatory cells, and you also have supporting cells. Okay, so these gustatory cells are going to extend what we call taste hairs through a pore. We call it a taste pore. Okay, so, so basically inside the taste buds are gustatory receptors. Okay. Now in terms of pathways, Taste buds get monitored by cranial nerves, the so nerves that go to the brain, that are synapsing within the nucleus solitarius in the brain. So conscious perception of taste, so that you're aware of it, is going to be produced as information received from your taste buds gets correlated with other sensory data, like the texture and the smell. So I don't know if you've watched cooking shows where they make people um, I, you know, not see what they're eating or not be able to smell what they're eating and, you know, just taste it. And some people can figure it out. Some people can't because for most people, their sense of taste is integrated with other senses. Okay. So discrimination for gust for gustation, you have dissolved chemicals that are contacting taste hairs and they're binding to receptor proteins in the gustatory cells. So this will result in releasing neurotransmitter by the receptor cell, okay? Right, and remember neurotransmitters associated with action potentials, right? Depolarization. So primary taste sensations, sweet, salt, sour, and bitter, okay? We've actually discovered more taste sensations. We have umami. Okay, so we've added that, and which is characteristic of things like broth, chicken broth, and beef, or beef broth, all right, and water. Okay. So in terms of your sensitivity in your tongue, okay, it varies depending on the region of the tongue. And Taste sensitivity is very individualistic in that one person's sense of sensitivity is very different from another. And some of that's actually inherited, okay? And you can do an experiment with what we call PT PTC paper uh, and get a sense of 
you know, whether or not people can taste certain things related to their genetics. All right, number of taste buds will get, will decrease as you get older, just like your olfactory receptors decreases as you get older. Okay, so your sense of smell and your sense of taste get worse as you get older. And you'll also have sensory loss. So food might taste bland and unappetizing. Okay, so sometimes you see people that as they age, they've got to put more seasoning on their food because they can't really taste it very well, right? Okay, so let's pause and, and talk to each other about what you've learned about gestation. And do this at home. Well, actually, before we pause, let me show you this image. All right. All right, here's your tongue. Okay, shows you, here's some taste buds. Okay, on the taste buds. All right, you've got individual taste buds here inside the papillae. Now, whole, this whole thing is a papillae, this is a valate papillae. And then down here are those taste buds with gustatory receptors. Okay. So if you look at an individual taste bud, now you're able to see gustatory epithelial cells. Those are your receptors. So inside the taste buds are the gustatory receptors, the ones here in pink. Okay. Your basal epithelial cells are stem cells. Yellow cells are transitional or support cells. Here are your taste hairs or microvilli and your taste pores, right, for things to get in. All right, other types of papillae. Here's your folate, foliate papillae, fungiform papillae, filiform papillae. Okay, each has a characteristic shape. But filiform, fungiform, foliate, and valate. Okay. So filiform looks kind of like flames to me. Okay. Filiform sounds kind of like flames. Valate, you got circles. Okay. Fungiform is kind of like a big bump and foliates more of a narrow bump, okay. All right. Now let's go ahead and take a break and talk to your partner about what you've learned about gestation. You can do this at home as well. Okay, now that we've covered gestation and olfaction, let's move on to vision. So our visual sense is our most used sense. Our eye has some accessory structures to it that are kind of assist and they can help by protecting, lubricating and supporting your eye. And those accessory structures in the eye or of the eye include your eyelids, the superficial epithelium, structures that deal with production, secretion, and removal of your tears. So in anatomy, we refer to the eyelids as palpebrae, okay? And the palpebrae are a continuation of your skin. And they are separated by what we call palpebral fissure. And they're connected at the corners that we call the medial canthus and the lateral canthus. Continual blinking will keep your eye surface lubricated and keep uh, dust and debris away from your eye surface. Your eyelashes, they line the margins of your palpebrae or the edges. And these are robust hairs that help prevent foreign objects and insects from getting to the surface of your eye. Along the inner margin of your lid are the meibomian <laughs> glands, and they secrete a product that is rich in lipids and keeps your eyelids from getting too sticky and sticking to one another. And a structure called the lacrimal caruncle, which you'll get to see in a little bit. 
you have glands there and they uh, produce different secretions and they help you by contributing what we call the sleep in your eyes, right? And some, you know, the little deposits after you wake up, right? So another term you need to know, and a lot of times, again, when you see these underlying terms, these are good matching questions. These cysts are chalazian or chalazian. It results in an infection of that meibomian gland or from an infection there. A sty, if anybody's ever had a sty in their eyes, it's painful swelling and it's caused by an infection. All right, it could be in a sebaceous gland of one of your eyelashes, could be in the meibomian gland, could be in a sweat gland between the different follicles. And conjunctiva, this is epithelium that covers the inner surface of your eyelids as well as the outer surfaces of your eye. Okay, if that gets inflamed, we call that conjunctivitis. All right. So palpebral conjunctiva is going to cover the inner surface of your eyelids and the ocular or bulbar conjunctiva covers the anterior surface of your eye. Okay. Now the cornea of your eye is considered transparent and fibrous. And fluids are gonna continuously wash over the surface of your eyeball. And it helps keep the ocular conjunctiva and the cornea clean and moist. All right, pink eye, all right, conjunctivitis, okay. Probably all know somebody who's had pink eye. Um, symptom here, you get reddening of the eye. You see that it is caused by dilation of blood vessels in the eye. And it can be caused by some sort of pathogenic infection. It could be by physical or chemical irritation on the surface of the conjunctiva. Okay. Tears. Okay. I'm sure you thought tears were just for crying. Uh, but tears actually serve some really important functions in your body. So they keep your conjunctival surfaces moist, as we just discussed. All right, we uh, are these tears will reduce friction in the eye. They can help remove debris. Okay, uh, they can also prevent infection by bacteria because of chemicals in it, the tears. They can also provide nutrients and oxygen, okay. Structure in the eye, one is called lacrimal apparatus. And it's to produce, distribute, and remove the tears. And it's a collection of multiple structures, the lacrimal gland, the lacrimal canal, the lacrimal sac, and the nasal lacrimal duct. And the glands are doing the producing, the canals are doing a lot of the distribution, and the duct is doing a lot of the removal, okay? So the fornix, just like you had a fornix in the brain, fornix in the eyes pocket where the conjunctiva of the eyelid is going to connect with the conjunctiva of the eye. Okay, lacrimal gland, it's going to provide most of the ingredients and the volume of tears. Lacrimal gland has secretions that are going to be slightly alkaline, which is basic, right? And they have lysozyme in them. Okay, remember that's enzyme. Anytime you see zyme, it's using an enzyme. Lyse means to break, so it breaks down bacteria. The lacrimal, let's see. Um, Tears from the lacrimal gland are going to collect in the lacrimal lake. Tears can reach the inferior meatus of the nose after they pass through lacrimal puncta, the lacrimal canals, and the lacrimal sac, as well as a nasal lacrimal duct. Okay, eyes are very sophisticated, okay? Very, very technical, 
All right, they have an irregular spheroid shape. So they're, they're spheres, but they're not completely round or they're, it's not a perfect sphere. All right, and they're a little smaller than a ping pong ball. Okay, inside your eye sockets, you've got padding and insulation and that's due to orbital fat. Eyeball is actually hollow. It has two main cavities. You have a posterior cavity, which is a large cavity. Okay, also known as a vitreous chamber. And it has a gelatinous substance in it called a vitreous body. Then you have an anterior uh, cavity, which is smaller toward the front. It's filled with aqueous humor. It's, it's clear. Aqueous is more watery. Okay. And the anterior cavity can actually be broken up into two chambers, anterior and posterior. So the eye is going to have, let's see, before we get into those layers, I want to show you a picture. There's a, there is a lot to learn about the eye. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves. All right, so here's an eye, right? You know what that is. Okay, so this is our palpebral fissure. Okay, it's kind of where the, the eyelids are separate from each other. You know where the eyelids, eyelids, eyelashes are. This corner here is a lateral angle. It's on the outside, medial angle is here. By the medial angle, it's the structure here that's that lacrimal caruncle we talked about. Okay. The, the black part of your eye is your pupil. Okay. All right, let's come over here. So the end by the medial angle, you see the lacrimal caruncle. Let's see. So here is our lacrimal gland and the lacrimal gland ducts. Okay. So moving those uh, tears. All right, and here's your nasal lacrimal duct. I'll show you that. And there's some orbital fat. We talked about that. All right, there's our bulbar conjunctiva. Okay. All right, so the rest of that we can talk about in a little bit because I don't think we talked about all of those other structures yet. Okay. All right, so going into, I will say going into the nasal lacrimal duct, or actually going into the, into the lacrimal sac here, this little pocket is the lacrimal sac, down here is the nasal lacrimal duct. But going into the lacrimal sac, you've got two little channels, the superior lacrimal canaliculus and the inferior lac, lacrimal canaliculus, they're little canals. Okay. All right. All right, so the eye's got three layers, outer fibrous tunic or covering, vascular tunic, and the inner neural tunic. The fibrous tunic, this is the layer on the outside, has a sclera, which is dense fibrous connective tissue, covers most of the eye's surface. It's the white part of your eye. So if you remember from US history, you know, when they were during the American Revolution, and they said, you know, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. They're talking about the sclera. Okay. So you have the cornea, which we've already discussed, and then the limbus. And it's the border between the sclera and the cornea. Okay, it's so the functions. Of the fibrous tunic provides mechanical support, some physical protection. You have an attachment site for the extrinsic muscles of the eye. It also contains structures that help your eye to focus. Okay. 
So your cornea is important. You get your cornea damaged, can lead to blindness. So injuries to the cornea have to be treated immediately to prevent losses to your vision. Typically, restoring vision after damage to the cornea is going to involve having a corneal transplant. Transplant. All right. Now onto the vascular tunic or the uvea. That's the middle layer. It has blood vessels there. It's a vascular layer. Also has lymphatics, intrinsic eye muscles. Okay, so they're a little deeper. And the vascular tunic is where you're going to find your iris. You get the color to your eye, ciliary body, and the choroid. So the vascular tunic provides a route or a pathway for lymphatics and blood vessels. It's going to regulate how much light gets into your eye. And it's going to secrete and absorb aqueous humor. It's going to control the shape of your lens. Iris contains some blood vessels, also contains pigment cells, contains muscle fibers, change the diameter of your pupil. That's the central opening for light. So the distribution and density of the melanocytes give your eyes color and the density of pigmented epithelium ultimately determines what we see as your eye color. Now your pupil has some muscles around it. You have pupillary constrictor muscles. They form concentric circles around your pupil. When they contract, the diameter of the pupil decreases, okay? Because you're constricting the pupil. And the pupillary diameter, you have, also have pupillary dilator muscles, excuse me. And they're going to extend radially away from the edge of the pupil. Okay, when they contract, the diameter of the pupil increases. So there, when they contract, it's pulling the pupil out. When the constrictor muscles contract, it pulls pupil in, essentially. Okay, another structure, ciliary body, contains ciliary muscle as well as ciliary processes. These are folds in your epithelium. Their role is to attach to the suspensory ligaments of the lens. And we'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. And the choroid contains a capillary network, it delivers oxygen, and nutrients to your retina. Okay. All right, so we'll pause here, look at an image. All right. So again, sectional, kind of, kind of sagittal section of the eye. All right, so you can, show, you can see the conjunctiva here, the eyelid. All right, so there's the pupil conjunctiva and the bulbar conjunctiva. Here's some eyelashes. This little space in there is the fornix. Okay, here's the cornea and the pupil, the iris, the lens. These little suspensory ligaments there connect the lens to the surface of the inner, inner surface of the eye. Okay, layers back here on the posterior surface. You got the sclera, the white part of the eye, deep to that. All right, you've got the choroid. Deep to that, you have the retina. Okay, so we'll get some more of these structures later, but again. Here's your anterior cavity and your posterior cavity. Remember your anterior cavity is smaller, has the aqueous humor, posterior cavity has the gelatinous or vitreous humor. Okay, again, you got the cornea, 
sclera. All right, here's your ciliary bodies connecting to these uh, suspensory ligaments. Okay, there's the iris, and this is your all in your vascular layer. And your fibrous layer is your cornea and your sclera. Inner layer. Okay, it's your neural layer, pigmented layer. Okay. All right. So won't get into all of the structures here, but what I will tell you again, in the anterior cavity, here's the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber, okay? All right. Okay. So let's take a pause and talk to your partner about what you learned about the eye so far. And then we'll get into the retina in just a moment. You can do this at your tables and you can do this at home as well. All right, so the neural tunic, the last of the three tunics or the retina, it's your innermost layer in the eye, has a pigmented layer and a neural retina. Pigmented layer is a, is a thin outer layer. It helps absorb light. You have pigment cells which can interact biochemically with retinal or with photoreceptors on the retina. They're receptors that respond to light. That's what photoreceptors are. Okay. Um, the neural retina. It's a thick inner layer where you find the photoreceptors. So the pigment cells in the pigment layer interact with the photoreceptors in the neural layer. And they support cells and neurons and they have blood vessels. And as I mentioned, the photoreceptors detect light. Condition related to that is a detached retina. So if the neural layer gets separated from the pigmented layer, the photoreceptors will start to degenerate, okay? And you'll lose vision. All right, they are two different types of photoreceptors, the rods and cones. Might have heard of those, maybe. All right, the rods are not for distinguishing between color, okay? It'll enable us to see low light conditions, okay? So your cones are for different distinguishing between different colors. Well, that's what allows us to see different colors. You have three types of cones and their stimulations in different combinations gives you a perception of different colors. And cones are gonna give you clearer and sharper images than your rods will. But the cones are gonna need more intense light. Okay, it takes light to perceive color. It takes a lot of light to perceive color. And the distribution of the rods and cones is not an even distribution on the retina. Okay. Area where you have no rods but lots of cones is the macula lutea. So it's just for perceiving color. Okay, central portion of that macula lutea is the fovea centralis or fovea for short. So the concentration of cones is the highest. It's where your vision is the sharpest. So your horizontal and amacrine cells are gonna facilitate or inhibit communication between photoreceptors, as well as ganglion cells. They're gonna to adjust to sensitivity in the retina Okay, so where does visual information go? You go it starts with the photoreceptors, okay, your rods and your cones, information is sent to bipolar cells, then information is sent to ganglion cells, 
that information then is sent to the optic nerve, which is a cranial nerve, and then on to the brain. All right, so axons and ganglion cells will converge at a place called the optic disc. And that's known as your blind spot. And that's the origin of the optic nerve. You have no photoreceptors in this area. So any light that hits your optic disc is unseen. Okay, so you wouldn't get any information from that area. Because you kind of have to have a space for the nerve to be. All right, retinopathy, so disease of the retina, okay? This path is usually, anytime you see path, like pathology is a study of disease. So retinopathy is disease of the retina. Diabetic retinopathy, you can develop in individuals with diabetes mellitus. You have degeneration and rupture of blood vessels in the retina. You lose visual perception. All right, so let's look at a couple of pictures. All right, so again, I just wanted to make sure you can see the different layers here. There's the sclera, choroid, retina. Okay, here's your optic disc. All right, and the fovea centralis. All right. All right, also want to show you information about the pupillary muscles. So you have your sphincter or constrictor papillae, circular, and then around it, you have the dilator papillae. So the sphincter papillae, so they're going to, when they constrict, your pupil constricts, diameter decreases when the dilator pupillae when they contract, your pupil dilates and your diameter increases. Okay, so your pupils are going to dilate when you have decreased light intensity. Okay, increased sympathetic stimulation as well. So if you're uh, nervous or something, you know, fight or flight response, your pupils will dilate. If there's not much light, pupils will dilate to try to get more light in. If you have increased light intensity, right, doctor shines a light in front of your eye, your pupils should constrict. Okay, if you have increased parasympathetic stimulation as well, your pupils will constrict. Okay. So more rest and digest. All right. All right. This picture shows you the macula, and in the center of that's your fovea centralis. Here's your optic disc or blind spot. We have no photoreceptors. Here's another view of the optic disc. Another layer, pigmented layer of the retina, neural layer. Okay. All right, but optic disc, remember that's where your optic nerve starts. All right. Here you can see the rods and the cones and the pigmented layer. There's a core right above it or deep to that. Here's your bipolar cells, your ganglion cells, and the light. Okay. And again, here's your layer, rods and cones, bipolar cells, ganglion cells, okay. All right.
All right. So let's pause and you can talk to each other about what you learned so far about the eyes. And we'll pick up in just a moment. You can do this at home as well. So in terms of chambers of the eye, your ciliary body and your lens are gonna divide the inside of your eye into two cavities. Posterior cavity, vitreous chamber, and a smaller chamber is anterior cavity. So, anterior cavity subdivided into anterior chamber and a posterior chamber. The anterior chamber is going to go from your cornea to the iris. Posterior chamber, it's going to be between the iris and the ciliary body and the lens. And we'll show you that in just a minute. Your aqueous humor is composed of fluid. It's going to fill in your anterior and your posterior chambers. It's formed by active secretion by epithelial cells from your ciliary body, as well as ciliary processes. Composition is going to be regulated by epithelial cells, and it serves to fluid. It's a fluid that provides cushion and actually uh, gives a transportation route for nutrition and for waste products. So all that fluid in the aqueous humor creates pressure and that helps maintain the shape of the eye and also stabilizes the retinous position on the eye. So when the pressure or fluids pushing against that inner surface of the cornea, you can measure that pressure. Again, it's called intraocular pressure because it's inside the eye. And that's one way to test for glaucoma. So fluid in the aqueous humor is gonna circulate within the eye and then diffuse through walls of the anterior chamber. Okay. Then it's gonna to go to what we call the canal schlem and the veins of the sclera. Okay, the removal rate is gonna normally keep pace with the rate of generation at the ciliary processes. All right, we talked about glaucoma just a minute ago. So this happens when the aqueous humor can't enter the canal of schlem. And that causes the pressure in the eye to increase, which causes a distortion in the soft tissues in your eye. And it's gonna create pressure that's gonna block action potentials in your nerve fibers. Start deteriorating your vision if it doesn't get corrected. Okay, it leads to blindness. So the vitreous body or the vitreous humor So here it's gelatinous. And it fills your posterior cavity. Provides st um, stability in the shape of the eye, provides support for the retina, and it doesn't get replaced. You just, you know, it's not one thing that you just have. It doesn't, it doesn't always get replaced. All right. So let's show you some images. All right. So here's your anterior cavity. All right, there's the anterior chamber from the cornea, okay, to the iris, posterior chamber, essentially from the iris, okay, down to the choroid, and kind of this aura serrata here. Okay, and then you have your posterior cavity down here, which is your vitreous chamber. Okay. 
All right. Okay, let's talk about the lens. Lens gets held in place by suspensory ligaments. It's gonna lie posterior to the cornea. It's gonna form the uh, anterior boundary of that posterior cavity. It's gonna focus a visual image on the retinal receptors. Okay, it'll focus by changing shape be made up of concentric layers of organized cells. All right, so you get capsular fibers that are elastic and they're gonna contract and that makes your lens more spherical, okay? You have lens fibers and then the interior of the lens and they're slender and they, get, they elongate. They're filled with structures we call crystallines, which are transparent proteins. Okay, cataracts, you've probably heard of these, medical condition. The lens loses its transparency. Okay, could be injuries, radiation, drug reactions that cause it. Okay, most common form has to do with aging. It's a senile cataract. It can sometimes look like there's kind of a covering over the eye. It's losing its transparency. All right. Over 130 million receptors in the retina. Okay. And you put that perspective, I mean, we're roughly around 300 million people in the United States. So you have almost half that number of photoreceptors in your retina. Okay, in one retina. All right. Um, each photoreceptor is going to monitor a specific location. You get a visual image that happens as a result of processing information that you get from all your receptors. So when an image is in focus, rays of light that arrive from that object are going to strike the surface of your retina. Okay, and that light's going to be focused on that spot. If the image is blurry, the rays are not perfectly focused. And there's two steps involved in focusing light. Light has to pass through the cornea, and then it's got to pass through the lens. So one of the properties of light is that light gets refracted. Okay, so if you remember at all, maybe from high school, maybe you took integrated physics and chemistry or physics or something like that. Uh, talk about refraction of light, but basically light, that just means light gets bent and it passes through one dense medium into a medium that has a different density. Okay. All right, so in a human eye, grayish refraction is gonna occur when light passes from air into the cornea. And you get additional refraction when light passes from the aqueous humor into the lens. So terms that you should know, focal point, it's just that point of intersection where the light rays get focused on a specific spot. Focal distance is the distance between the center of the lens and that focal point, okay? So the lens, in this case, the lens of the eye and the focal point on the back of the retina, okay? So that's determined by two factors. It could be the distance of the object from the lens and the shape of that lens, okay? Another term you should know is accommodation. So accommodation has to do with process where the shape of the lens is changing the focus image on the retina. And the lens is gonna become rounder, okay? It's gonna focus on a nearby object. But when your lens is trying to focus on a more distant object, the lens is gonna flatten. So 
So when the ciliary muscle is contracting, you're reducing a suspensory ligament tension, pulls the lens to, into a more spherical shape. Now when the ciliary muscle relaxes, the suspensory ligament uh, tension will pull the lens into a more flat shape, okay? All right, so ciliary muscle contracts, you get a spherical shape. Ciliary muscle relaxes, you get a flat shape. Okay. Okay, objects that are close to the lens are going to require the most refraction. Okay, you're going to need a lot of bending. If you think about angles, something's a long way to get to the lens. You don't need a, a large angle to get there, but if it's really close, so if you think about this is zero, that distance, you have a greater angle if it, you're close to the eye. So you need a lot of bending uh, to get toward the, if you think about like, if I'm trying to get from here, here's my object, here's the back of the eye, here's the lens of my eye. If the object's far away, the angle's relatively straight to get there to the back of the eye. But if the object's really close to the eye, you gotta do like this and then do like that. So you get a bigger angle. All right. So, Near point of vision is your inner limit for clear vision. And over time, your lens gets stiffer and less responsive. And your near point for vision distance is gonna increase. Now astigmatism, okay, this is a medical condition. Okay, degree of curvature in your cornea or your lens is gonna vary from one axis to another. The light passing through your cornea or your lens is gonna to fail to refract properly. Okay, your visual image gets distorted. Okay, the image reversal. So this is something that happens in, you know, with your vision and your brain. So object gets focused on your retina and you end up making a miniature image or miniature version of the image. It's upside down and it's backward. Okay, and the brain's compensating for that. So in your brain, you, your, your brain interprets it as right side up and the same size as it should be. Okay, but we're not aware of our brains doing it. It just does it for us. Okay. So visual acuity has to do with clarity of vision, rated against the normal standard. Right, normal is 20-20 vision. It means person can see details at a distance of 20 feet as clearly as they would with an individual whose vision is normal, okay? Person's got 20-30 vision, has to be 20 feet from an object to discern details that a person with normal vision would see at a distance of 30 feet. If you're legally blind, your visual acuity is below 2200. Okay, does that mean just you would have to see something at 20 feet that someone else could see from 200 feet? So blindness has to do with total absence of vision. And it's usually caused by diabetes mellitus, could be cataracts, could be cornea or corneal uh, scarring, detachment of the retina, some accidental injury, other hereditary factors. But it's total blindness, of the total absence of vision. Whereas legally blind person can still technically see, just doesn't see very well. All right, scotomas, medical condition. You have abnormal blind spots. Okay, we're supposed to have that one blind spot 
But if you have abnormal ones that are fixed in position, that is a scotoma. All right, so let's take a break and let's talk to your partner about what you've learned about vision. <laughs> 